Hi, everyone. I'm Don Ryan, Chief Strategy Officer at HFS Research. Today, we're going to discuss the business case and requirements for effective data management. Our research shows perception isn't always reality when it comes to data. With us today is Rex Allstrom, the CTO and Executive Vice President of Innovation and Growth at Synity. He leads the company's product strategy and development roadmap and drives customer adoption of its technology. We're also thrilled to have Alan Coulter, Distinguished Engineer and Global CTO for SAP Services at IBM. In his role, he drives value engineered outcomes for organizations transforming with SAP technology and IBM offerings. Synity and IBM have had a strong history and longstanding partnership, working to solve complex data challenges for some of the world's largest organizations. Data has become a core element of the strategy for every organization, both large and small. HFS Research recently conducted a global survey of over 300 senior business and technology executives from large enterprises to understand the state of data management and uncover areas of opportunities and how organizations need to face their data challenges. Today, we're gonna to review the findings and share examples of how companies can improve data management and data quality to drive business success. So Alan and Rex, the research is showing that data management is maturing and has an increased executive and senior management focus. All of our studies confirm this. What do you attribute this to? Uh, yeah, I, first of all, I think it's great that we're hearing that statistic. Uh, it means that the whole conversation about the importance of data has come out of the back office of companies and has really escalated to a level of understanding within executive teams that it is critical to how their business runs. So impacts to company performance, impacts to a company's ability to navigate in highly competitive markets and the ability to really advance, not stay behind in the marketplace is all driven by effective use of data. And the fact that executives are recognizing that and driving decision-making around it is a really positive outcome. Yeah, I think from my side, I think the, um, there's, there's two big items that I think that, um, you know, I, I spent my life really driving SAP programs, right? And there was always, um, you know, at the go live event that, that typically challenges were all down to data quality, right? Mm -hmm. and, um, less the actual real proper configuration. So I think just simply a reflection of the importance of data, right, has, has you know, evolved, right, um, over the years, right, from just simply you know, th think of it as a last mile data migration activity just to kind of go live into really understanding what it really means to have a proper data foundation. Um, I think the second major shift that we can see as well is the fact that, you know, when companies are starting to think about data, not just simply from the data quality, but actually as a foundation for analytics and insights, right? You've got, there's got to be more emphasis on the, the underlying data foundation, the data engineering. Right. And I think that's what's placing the emphasis that that you know we use the old phrase rubbish in, rubbish out, right? So if 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 your data quality is poor, right, or you can't drive meaningful, consistent insights and analytics from data, then the business impact of that transformational change is compromised. Right. So I think people are starting to make far more informed relationships between transformational value and the importance of the data management underneath it. That's interesting. Yeah, this 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 idea of analytics being the lifeblood and kind of foundation for companies going forward, especially with new applications such as generative AI, it just mm -hmm. it just puts a complete you know emphasis around data as as um, as something that drives company success. Mm -hmm. I I just wanted to add the research shows a clear disconnect though between perceived trust and usability of data. So we talked before about, uh, you know, the importance of data management. It's, it might not be um, driven in the organizations as much as it should be. But interestingly, 80% of executives suggest they trust their organization's data. And this was across all different user groups. But there's a significant delta, as we've been discussing, between trust and usability. So when asked what percentage of their data they deem consumable or usable, 
more than half of the respondents indicated this level is 60% or less. So roughly about half um, are only using 60%. They think 60% is usable, yet they trust it. Um, what do you attribute this to and what's, mm -hmm. what's kind of driving this disconnect that we've discussed um, before? I think it's a, a clear indication that the executives, again, see the importance of data. They may think that that is translated into breaking down of the silos within inside of a company to actually operationalize and really internalize how data management is executed. But the research clearly shows that that gap still exists. Yeah, yeah. So while it's important to the executives, I think the findings really clearly show that it's still being managed in silos within inside of the company. And if an analytics program is going to be really successful, and I know this is a particular passion of Alan's, you have to look at, at data more at a semantic level, right? At a higher level. But if how data is being managed is still siloed, you're really not getting that holistic view of data at an operational level that allows companies to achieve the goals they have through their analytics, through their generative AI programs, through all the other things that they hope to achieve. So a big gap between desire and sponsorship, which is a really positive thing, to the actual execution of what it takes to actually do effective data management. Also, there's also another aspect about there's data that you own and generate as your own company. And then there's data that you acquire or consume. Uh, and, you know, so, so where's the control point? How do you then start to, um, how can you provide proper data management when you're only really impacting, influencing a, a, a fragment of that data? I think a really good example of this is, you know, we're seeing this kind of, this orientation towards sustainable sustainability. And when you look at data in the context of scope one, scope two, scope three, that companies can understand and can put some control points around their scope one and scope two to drive some meaning, meaningful insights. But, but most of the kind of sustainable action really comes in scope three. And that's where the data is really being, is externalized and is being consumed. And therefore, you know, how can you guarantee that quality of the data then to drive the meaningful insights around sustainability that then you would do as a company to take downstream action to improve ESG operational and capabilities, right? So, you know, I, I mean, I mean, it's it's. I mean, data is becoming a complex topic, right? It's not just simply the old days where you just generated your own data set, you put in your own data management practices, you, you know, you you tied it to the applications, and hey, presto, you got a good data framework, right? So today, what we're seeing is say more and more companies, you know, managing data, acquiring data, trying to consume data to provide these types of insights and analytics. So it's becoming more complex, right? And therefore, I think that's when you see companies challenging the, the usability um, of, of, of data or information to drive these types of insights and analytics, I wouldn't think it's all, only down to your own management framework. It's also down to the fact that reality today is you're buying and consuming data from inside and outside of the organization to drive you know, the new meaningful insights that you need as a business going forward. Yeah, yeah. yeah and I think that's a... That's perfect, Alan, because you're talking in the context of a business process. And that's the other area where things typically break down when it comes to data quality. You know, mm -hmm. Here's the person responsible for customer master, material master, the other objects that are deemed important to the company. Uh, but what we're really talking about is impacting business processes. Mm -hmm. And until you impact the business process at a meaningful level, you're not achieving the benefits that you can get from understanding levels of data quality, yeah. whether it's sustainability, whether it's supply chain, um, you know, maintenance and repair operations. There's so many different use cases mm -hmm. to see with customers uh, where, again, they're thinking data quality siloed by object rather than looking at the overall business process that's being impacted. So, so would you attribute kind of the root cause of poor data management or poor usability to this lack of addressing data in silos and kind of this underlying lack of business process to, to, to really understand and drive the data through the organization? Or, or are there other things as well that you would attribute this to? 
I, I think it's one big contributor. And, yes. and I can give you a few examples. Right? When we go in and look at data quality from a customer perspective, we're looking at business processes together with data quality. So for example, a company may be going in and trying to get rid of vendor duplicates, right? We want to clean up our vendor file. And so, you know, we're going to clean up our vendor master. But when we look at it, we also look at things like, for example, vendor discounting. Uh, if they do have duplicates, they may actually not be getting all of the discounting or rebates potentially that are available to that company because they're not aggregating all the information in one view across a vendor, right? So unrealized uh, savings, same thing with uh, things like order to cash processes. If I've got payment terms that are all over the place, right. those payment terms were decided in the, in the moment, right? To, to be able to get something out the door and are retained, it may not follow the corporate policy. And so you may not be driving cash collections the way you should be, which is going to impact cash flow, right? So it's it's not just these discrete elements as they relate to the data quality pieces, but how they're related across that continuum. That process, yeah, that yeah. you're trying to drive. Alan, do you want to comment on this? I mean, the research shows there are major upsides to data quality. You know, generally, if the quality is twice as good, we asked this question in the survey, companies would be much more competitive, more innovative and make faster mm -hmm. decisions. Actually, come, what was interesting in the study was people, the, the respondents against senior managers for the most part could make this correlation between good data and company performance. Um, but what do you see, uh, Rex highlighted a couple of hurdles um, in fixing bad data and keeping it clean. What might be some, some others to kind of, um, drive this, this, this upside that data, um, that data can bring? No, I, I think Rex called out um, some of the key ones, right? So when you look at, I think, you, I mean, for us, you know, it's, it's driving also that association of, you know, the, the data and the business value. And the, and the value yes. is actually when you're really, um, you know, as I said before, rubbish in, rubbish out, right? If, if you really have a, a poor underlying data you know, engineering foundation, right? Then the way that you consume it to drive meaningful business insight is is therefore compromised, right? And you know, as Rex said, that, you know, there's some some obviously basic examples around discount leakage and things of that nature, right? So so, so we see the same thing, right? This is why we're working with with Rex and the team, right? Is because for us, it, the, the 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 outcome isn't about getting data to high quality the, the, that's just simply the 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 um the enabler the, the 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 kind of the the ultimate goal is actually how do we fundamentally improve um the, the business performance right so how do we actually start to really impact the the the, the cash flow or the or, or the bottom line behaviors right that it's that's why we have this um that this this work undertaken basically right um but i still come back to it that 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 um Especially on the, the the trust aspect that 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 you know that that we see today you know for a lot of times you know when we, we talk about the, the trust in AI for example right so if if you're driving a a recommendation to like a an organisation um, to say the fact that you know, let, let's take an example right if I was I remember there was one really good example whereby we were doing some work around. Um, precision mining, for example, right? To say that this would be the place where you would get the right type of yield, you know, or the, the outcomes, et cetera. So we were generating some recommendations through, through AI insights. Now, if, if, that, if that geologist doesn't actually drive the same meaningful, if he hasn't got the same kind of sentiment or, or reaction to that, to that AI out, outcome, is it because he doesn't believe in it, or is it because the data is not high quality? Right. Is right. a lot of data sources. So, so that this association with the, the 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 data accuracy, the trust in that data, with the with the ability to consume data. I always there's a phrase I always use: the fact that any idiot can create an insight, right? But it's 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 only got value when the insight is consumed by the business consumer. Does it actually drive value? And that's really where the trust aspect comes in, right? And and that's why we for us definitely. That the, the 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 root cause of that trust starts with good quality data engineering at the, at the foundation. 
Interesting. Does 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 governance play a, a role in this? So people have to have the trust in the data, but is there something from an organizational standpoint and from a governance perspective that 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 drives this trust and usability as well from your experience? Well, I mean, I think Rex I think Rex picked up on that you know, just before, right? So so when you get to the situation whereby you you may have a process, but you end up with actually, for whatever reason, thousands of payment terms, right? So yes. You, you know, so that all just comes down to like proper good governance mechanisms, to be up to be honest, right? Therefore, you know, having that meaningful governance, you know, and 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 um, in place allows you to make sure the fact you don't get to that point whereby your data quality is so eroded that it becomes almost like you know, the, the, the value becomes almost like redundant when you actually start applying it to a kind of business process outcome. So, I mean, the two things go hand in hand. I mean, I mean, you, you, you can't have good data management practices if you don't have the effective governance in place, right? And we're yes. not just talking about systems like MDG systems, we're talking about proper operational governance mechanisms, yeah. Yeah, and, and part of that, um, and well said, Alan, I, I think part of that is also understanding that governance, it's a pretty broad term. <laughs> But part of your governance processes has to really focus on what data really matters and what yeah. quality is really required. Right? Mm -hmm. As a point of diminishing returns, like what is the difference if my data quality on my you know, customer master is 97% versus 99.9%? Um, what elements of the data actually have an impact to a business outcome? Mm -hmm. And so you know, governance strategies it's not just an implementation of technology, it's really developing a much better understanding of how data impacts the business. And therefore, where can I get the highest impact if I were to focus on data quality? Interesting. Interesting. And what do I expect that outcome to be? So who's making those decisions, Rex, within organizations? I mean, is there is there a group, is there a data quality group that we point to, or is this a functional management responsibility it should be shared and yeah. the, the, when we talked earlier right when we opened up the session we mentioned the siloed nature of data yes. quality but this is the problem right you you have somebody who is the domain owner for a particular data object and they're working on improving that data object but they may not have the full context of how that ties into other data objects and how ultimately that boils up to the KPIs that the company is right. managing. Right. And <clears throat> I think it'd be valuable for, for Alan to touch on the, the semantic model concepts because that's what that's the silo that we're trying to break down, right? Yeah. yeah. We want to understand the impacts of data at the business level, but too often the data quality problem is looked at in silos. Yeah, it was interesting. I was actually with a customer last week, right? And we were... <laughs> We were, we were looking at, you know, they, they said that their data quality is horrible, right? And, uh, and um, you know, we were asking you know, the, the root cause behind it, right? And, um, and a lot of it was to your point, Rex, right? That, that it's seen as a very silo domain exercise, yeah? Um, so one of the things that we talked about is really that, that when we start to evolve the way that we address this, it's not just actually trying to force down more data quality, it's more about why is data important, right? Uh, and, and really looking at, at the business term rather than just simply the, the, the kind of the procedural term of actually someone saying, I've got, I'm, a, I'm a data management function, I need to do X, Y, and Z. It just becomes routine. They, they lose the intimacy between what they're trying to do and the, and the benefit of, of why they're doing it, really, largely speaking. But, but I think, as I say, one of the things we started talking about is... is that to be today, even, even beyond the domain, sometimes data is locked into like an application management function. Mm -hmm. So I've got a big SAP system, I've got all of these data objects, I need to manage this because actually SAP says the fact that you know this data has to be of a certain quality or a certain schematic to actually drive this kind of like transactional activity. Where we're at today is obviously when, when we start to kind of really decouple the data from the underlying application, when we, when we have this kind of more semantic view mm -hmm. that data is actually treated as an object across the entire business, right? So what, what does a customer mean is it's consistent not to just simply an, an ERP application, but to a, C, a CRM application or a pricing application, right? So we've you've got that sort of like semantic management mechanism 
right? And then you use that to then drive the, the foundation for the insights and analytics. So this, this sort of like decoupling of, of data from the system and actually managing it is a, is a, 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 a more semantic, holistic activity, for example, I think is, is one major trend that we see as well, Don, going forward that, that, that more companies will buy into. Um, I think it will become necessary, right, as we move from big ERP-centric philosophies to more right. like leaner ERP and more heterogeneous um, landscapes. Um, and I think that in itself will improve the actual function and meaning and, 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 and approach and how companies actually treat the data management as well going forward. Yeah. So, so does this kind of drive a new way of organizing and managing data. So today it's, you know, in many organizations, not all, but, but many, data is still largely under the purview of IT and is seen as a technical tool or at least the management of it. Um, what you're arguing with the semantic model is, you know, this has to be more distributed and yeah. have more, you know, business focus. So this, yeah. is, this is kind of a big shift. How do you, you know, how do you, how do you see this moving forward, what are the steps that companies really need to take to, to drive this? I couldn't agree more that it needs to be done, but what needs to change? So I, I can give you an example. Um, I work with a lot of our large enterprise customers um, yes. along with Alan. And, uh, and when you look at, at both Synity and IBM, obviously we're out there solving some of the largest data problems for some of the largest companies in the world. And to Alan's point, they have very heterogeneous environments. It's not uncommon for us to go in and see you know, 200 different ERP systems. Right. A lot of times that's driven through a lot of merger acquisition and divestiture activities right, in these large enterprises. Uh, I'm working with a, a company out of Germany that implemented, uh, they called it a migration factory. Uh, but the concept that, look, we're going to be doing a lot of buying and a lot of selling. And every time we do that, there could be an impact to business process. Uh, every time we do an acquisition, maybe there's something new that we would learn that we want to incorporate into our business process. So they establish multiple levels within inside of the company um, as peers, right? The person who would be responsible for the technical artifacts and making sure that, that we can get data loaded and moved and transformed but also the peer that understands the business process and the impact yeah. that, that data will have. And so they have actually a council that will meet. And so if they do a new acquisition, they'll understand what are there in new opportunities that we may want to incorporate into our global template, our global policy, uh, or what things need to be changed to conform to our global policy. And that decision cannot be made purely by technologists because obviously it has big impacts in terms of how the business runs. Um, and with that, they've been able to achieve a much faster time to completion uh, on both divestiture and acquisition opportunities. And it's had a really positive impact on the business because it's elevated data, not just from the executives wanting it to be good, but to actually into something that's being operationalized by a joined team. And was this driven by the C? So what's what's been the role of the C-suite in making these changes? Is this yeah, is this is this, a, is this a vision or is this more hands-on? No, what, what, what this, is, this is real. Like the the yeah. C-suite wanted it for for a lot of good reasons, right? When yeah. when you do. A, an acquisition, you typically have uh, an agreement in place uh, from the acquiring, from the selling company that says, hey, we'll operate the system and this operation until you're prepared to run it. Um, these agreements have deadlines on them. If those deadlines are missed, there are very punitive cost impacts to the company. Okay. Um, so the C-suite knows there is a huge financial impact if we don't do these things as planned and integrated into the business, there could be lost revenue because uh, they're not able to uh, optimize why they bought that company in the first place on the acquirer's side. Mm -hmm. So absolutely, it has a lot of visibility at the C-suite. And so the reporting goes all the way up in the scenario I described. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the things we saw actually, I mean, but we, I remember we were discussing this with a few companies that during COVID, for example, when companies had to make some really quick decisions about how they just simply survived, they, they actually got to the point whereby there, was, there wasn't actually a, 
a mechanism of consistently measuring the business, mm. right? Because the way that every maybe organization or, or silo division was, was providing measurement, you know, um, insights, for example, meant the fact that you really could make a determination about, you know, where should you continue operations? Where should you shut down? Like, where do you sort of continue to do business, for example? Where's my, big, where's my biggest areas in the market where I can drive uh, the biggest profit, right? So I think COVID was also an inflection point as well that, that really brought home to roost the fact that, that, that companies had sort of, in some areas, lost control of the, 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 foundation, the foundational element of actually business measurement, right? Okay, never mind business value, but just simply baseline comparative measurement. And, and therefore, I think that was then also a, like a, a really trigger point to then really yeah. start looking at the, the, the foundational mechanics of how do I measure, how do I compare, how do I report? And, and that really put the emphasis on the, the, the data management and quality, for example, as well, right? So you could manage that consistently. So that was that was a retrospective view that we saw from COVID. But to your point um, um, as well, Don, about I think the C-suite, I mean, let's be honest, right, for years, we, we, would, nev- we would never have heard this phrase of a chief data officer. Yes, like, yes. The, 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 you know, so therefore, the, so, so the, 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 the relationship of data and value, because the CDO is typically also the one who's actually got the, the transformation ownership. So therefore, transformation is also then tightly coupled with, with the importance and relevancy of data, for example, as well, right? The two things are largely kind of, um, um, you know, um, really tightly coupled, right, about the transformation, the CDO and the transformation officer. So obviously companies are really starting to see the fact that as part of that transformational journey to, to get that 1%, 2%, 3% extra benefit, for example, to, to really then have that, quality, trust in data to drive the more meaningful insights, to drive cash flow optimization, to drive operational optimization, you've got to have that solid foundation. But your point also, you said earlier that, that it's not just about, therefore, an object that you manage, right? This whole democratization of data, the fact that it's the business that are saying the fact that if I have this quality of information or this insight, I can drive another action. So you've got that sort of into relationship between the business or the data scientist saying the fact that here's what I want to do and the data I must have, and then the IT providing the baseline engineering capability to provide those insights. So it is becoming a more of a collaborative mechanism, right, in how we manage and optimize data today for organizations. That's good. So, yeah, so, so, you know, we think about data in terms of application accessibility and implementation and operations, but you know, if we take it up a level, everybody talks about digital transformation that yeah, incorporates sure. many, many different aspects, but mm-hmm. it's, you know, the number one objective of, of the, of the um, Global 1000 and all the studies we've done. So I think people, as, as you're saying, Alan, they're making this connection to these higher order objectives mm-hmm. and driving change management around that. Yeah. But, but is there any specific examples around data and digital transformation that you see it? some companies and maybe maybe bring in the SAP example um, of um, some of the things that you're working on at, 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 at IBM is SAP data and digital transformation all kind of working together. So, so again, coming back to it, right? so, so let, let's look at some examples, right? So therefore, when you're looking at things like um, the digital transformation is really locked into actually better experiences in the value chain. Yes. Right? So therefore, how do I know how do I understand my, not just simply my, my customer master, but what is the information I need from that customer to drive the highest level of intimacy regarding buying behaviors or, you know, preference behaviors, for example, as well, right? So therefore, it's not as simply that they kind of be, that the data objects that drive the actual transactional information. It's also then the, 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 um, the aspects of that customer that we need to know as well, which actually to drive the highest level of, as I say, customer insights, customer intimacy. We, all, we, we talk about this like 360 view of the customer, which sometimes is a bit kind of, you know, twee for the example, right? But but the, the principle behind it, the logic in, in behind it is the fact that the more you know, the better you can serve that customer's um, um, attitudes. It's not just about transactional excellence. It, it really truly is around value chain um, improvements, for example, rather than just simply process improvements and the same goes for suppliers 
right? And I think what we're seeing today with, with, with some suppliers and, and the way that we're doing some of the behaviours is how can I also then turn that supplier insight into cash flow optimization behaviour, right? I've been really working with companies like Tolia, for example, that are really looking at the data behind the supplier and, and, and the way that we improve those supplier relationships to really improve the kind of the cash flow optimization. So, so I think there are many examples, Don, right, around, um, you know, bet- between discount leakage, between, um, you know, optimization, cash flow optimization, customer intimacy. They're, they're all the things which are really important to customers. They all have their foundation and largely an SAP backbone, but it's more than just simply the, the data that we need to actually f- perform the actual functional task of a, an order entry or a, yes. or, a, or, or order execution, for example, when we get into the supply chain downstream. Yeah. Um, so I think that's what we can see, right? That, that, that digital transformation for us isn't just something about transactional compliance. It's more about, you know, it, you know insights. And insights come from just simply, you know, SAP sources, but other sources, for example, as well, that we need to then use to drive this. The one, I mean, I'll give you another example as well, right? I mean, again, we talked about, you know, today we do a lot of work in, in like things like mining industries or, or, or oil and gas industries, for example. Yes. It, it, or any company which is an asset intensive business, for example, right? So therefore, there's a direct correlation between the use of that asset and, the, and, and revenue, complete direct correlation. And it's more than just simply predictive maintenance. I mean, I mean, we've been doing predictive maintenance for years, right? But, but what is actually causing? What, what's the the, the cause or the effect of that machine to be disruptive? Hmm. Is it weather information? Is it operator information? As well as just simply the trending analysis. So, data, as I said before earlier, the data today for me isn't just simply transactional data. It's data from actually all sources, like weather information, like um, um. Uh, you know, um, other, you know, OT system type information that we need to truly drive those digital transformational um, outcomes as well, right? So, so data for me today is, 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 is a, a step beyond how we've always looked at it. It's just simply a compliance function and more today is a case of a totality, a, to, a total view of how we can manage that data to drive, as I say, those insights and optimizations through AI or whatever to drive those digital transformational outcomes that everybody talks about. It's, it's yeah, and I, I think a lot of uh, what we see as well and very well said, Alan, is that companies that really are tackling the, the digital transformation journey oftentimes have, you know, 10, 20, 30, you can count the number of years of systems and legacy mm. that are holding them back in achieving that. Um, and again, it's not uncommon that we'll see companies with 200 different applications and, and lots of old data, and they're not sure what to do with it. They don't know what they can get rid of. Their auditors maybe won't let them get rid of it. Right, right. right? So, so they're dealing with this, this mess. And, you know, very simply, uh, as they modernize those applications, as they look at lean ERP, as they look at, how they can really optimize at the business level, as Alan described, that type of digital transformation requires data transformation. You can't get to an effective digital transformation scenario without considering how data needs to be transformed and purposed and understood and governed as part of that digital transformation journey. I think the risk you've got to also count as well is the fact that there's, it's easy to say the fact that we want more and more and more and more in data, right? Um, but Rex, you, you, you pointed out earlier the fact that there's a balance between the data that's actually val- data that's actually valuable versus just simply data that's acquired, okay, yeah. um, and managed. And, and and I think one of the, the the things that we're seeing with lots of companies now going forward is this emphasis on data right sizing. Yeah. Right. So actually, what data do I need to drive true operational or meaningful business intelligence versus what data does, do I need to have infrequently versus data that I just simply can just simply carve out, freeze, archive, whatever you want, basically. Right. So, so I think that what we're seeing is a fact, that especially when we've been moving a lot of these big applications to cloud computing, for example, and also to HANA as well, right? Mm. That the more data you have, the more costly it is to actually uh, own and operate. So therefore, I think we've got to be 
I think as we go forward, I think we'll, we'll start to become far more um, precise around the, the data that's actually needed in the, in the, the, the fabric of the organisation that is truly the data that's really needed to drive the real business meaningful impact and then we'll drive those right-sizing behaviours. I think this, this is becoming, for me, in the last few you know, conversations we've had for the past year or so, is becoming a real situation for customers that they are the cost the, the, the TCO of running their systems and cloud through that that cost of data ownership and also the cost of running HANA for example is becoming punitively high because they haven't done the due diligence of that data management foundation. Not about it's not about quality or consistency. It's actually about volume that, that we're addressing now. Yeah. So it's not yeah. just about access, it's about this right sizing. Yeah, and when considering right sizing, that's it's multifaceted as well, right? Because as Alan said, the the cost of managing data that really shouldn't matter to the business anymore is high. Yet again, companies are fearful of of changing what they believe they need, which means you have to go to the business with insights to help them make that decision. How best to right size? What do I truly need? What is being used by the business today that's critical? And can you prove that to me by assessing how data is used at our company, yeah. right? So the first part of getting into a right-sizing effort is really having a business process, business outcome-driven assessment that says, we can prove to you what data actually matters to your company based on how your company runs. And then from that, build the case for, decommissioning systems for archiving data, right? Then get to the right amount of data, right? The right sized environment that not only reduce your costs, but it's going to optimize your business. Right. Because then you're focused more on the business process. You know, you have the data you need. You're not carrying around all the extra baggage. You know, we always like using the fun analogy of, uh, you know, Hey, we're selling our house. We've been in this house for 20 years. And we're going to move to a new house. You don't take absolutely everything that's in your house. You got lots of boxes. You probably right, haven't right, moved right. since the last time you moved. You're not going to just take it all and shove it all in your brand new house. You're, you're going to right size. And, uh, you know, there's no difference from that uh, to what needs to be done within these businesses on the data side. It's funny. We started with the discussion of business process and we're kind of ending up at that point. Um, <laughs> yeah, so Don, as well. for us as well, like when we you know, really kind of defined our kind of clean core philosophy. It, it really wasn't what SAP were talking. It wasn't about just simply fixing the code, right? You know, when we looked at it, it was really looking at good process, good data and good system engineering, right? Because you, you can't, to have a really proper clean core foundation, right? You've got to drive the association of all those three dimensions, right? You can't, if the systems, if, if an engineering system is a bottleneck to, to business value, you've got to fix that. But if your data is poor, you've got you know, you've got to fix that too. If your process is, it doesn't matter if your system's good or your data's good. If your process is bad as well, right? Then you're you're not going to get the best outcome. So our clean core philosophy really is around, you know, merging those three worlds together, right? And and, and data really is the, the I think the middleware, right? Between yeah. between that kind of system engineering and the and the process consumption. Interesting. Yeah, yeah that's interesting. Um, there's we've talked before about the work that you're doing with Heineken. Can you bring that up or maybe talk about that in, in light of the process discussion that we're having and the data migration and, and, and middleware? No, I think the Heineken one was, a, you know, a, a, I think a really great example of, of two things, right? When, when we started to see companies that had spent years on a big ERP-centric philosophy starting to move into this world of what they call like a linear ERP, right? Yes. Then, the, you know, what what we what, what was obvious then is the fact that the data can't be locked into the system. It has to be elevated. It has to be moved into like a, a proper enterprise data management framework, for example, right? Because data is no longer, if you lock it into the system, there's so much disruption in that system because we're moving to this linear ERP philosophy that that the value becomes eroded. So therefore, one of the, the, the foundational things that was done at Heineken was really truly recognizing that, that data truly is an enterprise 
product, right? And, and, and therefore it's managed as an enterprise product. It's, there's a complete semantic management regarding mm. customer, um, supplier, material product, you know, um, et cetera. So that, that was a real foundational thing that Heineken did. And it was really advantageous to actually help them go from this ERP-centric world of life into this kind of more leaner ERP philosophy and then start moving in towards more composability. So, so I think for me, that was a, a really great lesson learned around when companies are making this, this kind of shift in their, in their sort of application philosophy, right, that, that, that abstracting that data from the system and managing it as a semantic you know, um, um, object or a, a semantic um, capability was foundational to the success as well. Yeah, and, I, and I think I think it's a great example too of the the partnership that Cindy and IBM have together. We've been working there for a number of years, and um, the other thing that I think has made us successful is that if you look at the traditional ways that these problems have been tackled, right? ETL tools, uh, Excel, right? Something that gets used for a lot of use cases that it probably shouldn't. Um, when you try to achieve this goal of bringing data up to the business process level, you're involving more stakeholders. And if everything you're using is a highly technical tool that uh, you know, technologists can use, but you're not empowering business users yeah. to be part of the process in the product, right? In how you actually achieve the goals, um, then you're really not achieving the result either quickly using brute force, you're throwing a lot of, you know, IT people at it. And if they're going to be a partner at the table, you have to consider how does that actually work, right? What are the techniques that we will use? Does it respond to the different personas that are involved in that operation? Mm -hmm. And again, that's something I think we were able to achieve at Heineken. That was uh, pretty special. Yeah. yeah. Great example. So, um, I think we've discussed all the questions I wanted to get into, but I want to ask um, each of you, what's the one piece of advice that you'd give to our audience that's, um, that's come out of the research and also your experience? So Rex, do you want to go first? What I would say is uh, data is critical as we've all discussed, right. but it's also complicated. And so uh, what we see often is that, you know, that customers will think it's just a technical problem and will just try to then solve that just with technical tools. Um, and it's, it's like anything else in life. If, if I have a really complex plumbing problem happening down in my basement or I got to rewire something within the house electrically, uh, yeah, I could give it a go. Uh, but I'd rather not drown or be electrocuted. So bring in an expert, right? Bring people in that do this for a living and that can probably expose you to tools that not only they can use, but that can be leveraged by the business to become a partner in how you go and solve the problems. Interesting. Alan? No, I, I agree. Right. So, so, so I think that as we go forward, we've got to think of data as a, as a democratized capability, right? It can't be locked into technology engineering, right? Because we've got to drive the association between data and the business transformation, right? And technology in itself can't, can't achieve that, yeah? So, so, so the more that we think of data as a, as a true asset, um, when we think about it is in the way that it drives this, this real meaningful intelligence, the real business value, um, to get the business involved in the kind of the, what data is important, what data do I need um, how do I then consume it, you know, whether it's inside or outside the organization? These are the things which are vital for success for any customer going forward in this whole next generation of their business transformation philosophies. That's great. That's great. Well, yeah. Alan and, and Rex, thank you very much for this insightful discussion. And for our audience, go to Cinity or HFS website and download our research report, Perception Isn't Always Reality the case for more effective data management. So thanks again, and we'll talk soon.